Hi guys, I'm Randy with BRS TV and today we're at WWC with the first of three tanks that were set up and are running on the WWC method so that you can replicate the same success in your own home. So we're starting with the 900 gallon tank in the back of the WWC retail store, which is taken care of by Josh, the retail manager who ultimately runs all the systems here at WWC. Thanks Randy. I run the retail facility here at Worldwide Corals. I'm also responsible for a lot of the display tanks around the shop as well as the aquaculture that happens within the retail facility. So I've also been responsible for system design, care, and maintenance on these display tanks. So Josh, how long has the 900 been set up for? So the tank is about four years old now, a little over three years with coral. Of course, we wanted to get everything settled in, and get our inverts in there, go over the ugly algae phase, and here we are now. So after the water was added, how long until you turned the lights on? Uh, our lights turned on about the three month mark. And only about a month after that, we decided we we're gonna do coral. So Josh, how big is this thing? And why did you select 900 gallons? So the tank is 12 feet long, four feet from front to back, and 30 inches tall. And we actually purchased it from a customer of ours. So you asked why 900 gallons? Because we can grow big colonies in 900 gallon. Our intent was to put all of our broodstock colonies for fragging purposes into this tank. So what are the benefits of broodstock colonies versus one inch frags? We feel that colonies grow much faster than frags do. So in a frag tank, you're only growing frags. In a display tank, you're growing mass. Josh, can you share with us your team's ideal display tank cycle? Yeah, generally we'll let things sit for four months. I mean, it's, it's a good, solid, bulletproof plan. The more we leave it alone, the better it's going to do from the get-go. Tell us about the reasoning behind some of the fish that you chose for this tank. A lot of the fish that we have in this display tank are utilitarian fish. We have a whole slew of yellow tangs, I believe in excess of a dozen. We have a few wrasses, which their sole purpose would be to pick out the little critters we don't want. We have a large copper band butterfly who is probably the pride and joy of the tank. He makes sure that we never have any aptasia to deal with. Let's talk about your cleanup crew in this tank. What kind of snails, what kind of inverts do you guys have? In this tank, we only have a few snails, really. I think the copper van takes pretty good care of those as well. We have a few large zebra turbos. They're primarily nocturnal, so we don't see them come out much. There's a whole slew of red banded trochus snails. And I believe the only others we have would be maybe lettuce nudibranch, um, which are really good about bryopsis. With the proper water parameter and the right amount of fish to take care of the algae in the system, we don't feel the need for a lot of inverts. So recently at BRS, we've been talking about the four primary elements of marine tank biology. Chemistry, filtration, lighting, and nutrients. Starting with chemistry, what's the pH average on this thing? So our tanks generally run right around 7.9 to 8.1 on a given day. It's a pretty small area with a good handful of people. It tends to drive the pH down a little bit lower than we would like. How about ORP? Do you guys have a probe or even track it at all? We do have a probe, no we don't track it, and it doesn't really seem like pertinent information for us. Let's talk about the big three, calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. What do you guys shoot for here? We try to keep our alkalinity at about 8.6, calcium levels right around 480, and magnesium about 1440. Oh wow, that seems pretty high for calcium and magnesium. Is there a specific reason why? It gives us a little bit of a buffer point. You know, we are humans, we do make mistakes, so if it does drop, it's still within the acceptable range. So you said 8.6 for alkalinity. Is that pretty stable or does it deviate sometimes? We would expect to see no more of a 0.5 in fluctuation. And if you're asking range, I would say no less than 7.9 and no more than 8.9. What are you guys using to maintain those levels? We have calcium reactors made by GEO um, to help keep our calcium and alkalinity stable. So with the other options out there, why a calcium reactor? For large system volumes, it is very economical. You know, we go through very little media as opposed to two-part if we were to use that. What kind of media do you guys use? We use ARM Extra Course because it allows the water to pass through the media really well. How often are you guys changing out the media? Depending on the system volume, right about six months. After the first six months, we'll add to the media. After that, the second time, we'll usually throw it away and replace it with new media. How come the second time you guys replace the entire thing of media rather than add more on top? The media actually shrinks and settles to the bottom, now allowing the flow to pass through it the way that it should. And we get a lot of detritus buildup. Not to mention, there are some bits that never fully dissolve. 
Uh, what are you guys using for the magnesium supplement? We use Brightwell Magnesium P to buffer our salt water. Speaking of your guys' acceptable ranges, what if alkalinity and calcium were to stray? In most cases, we would just do multiple water changes to get it back to where we need it to be. In rare cases, we would use calcium P to buffer our calcium and 8.3 to buffer alkalinity. So that's the big three. What about things like trace elements? We don't test for trace elements, so we leave our water changes directly responsible for replenishing those missing elements. Ultimately, following our recipe and keeping it simple has yielded incredible tanks, beautiful coral, and long-term success with very little failure. So you guys probably go through a ton of salt water. What salt mix do you guys use? We use Brightwell Neomarine Salt. Its alkalinity matches very similar to what we have already in our systems, as well as the magnesium and calcium levels. Having a good level of magnesium is important to us because it is more cost effective than adding supplements. So that's a couple of times you've mentioned Brightwell. Why Brightwell? Well, we've used Brightwell since early on. And I mean, as you can see here, all of our tanks do really, really good with their supplies. So there's no point in changing what's already working. So on this 900 gallon system, what are you guys using to mitigate salinity changes and to top off the evaporation? Well, here we actually top off manually because there's a lot of water removed daily from the system and we can't have only fresh water going back in. So we will actually test it at the end of every day and add the required water back. What do you guys maintain for temperature on a tank this size? Most of our systems here ride right around 78 degrees. It's maintained pretty much by ambient room temperature and the amount of mass water volume within the facility itself. So are you telling me you guys have no heaters? No heater. Perks of living in Florida. Heaters are one of the largest failure points within the aquarium hobby. By not having unnecessary heaters, it keeps us true to what we do here. We keep it simple. The next component of reef tank biology is filtration. How do you guys tackle a skimmer? On this system, we use an XP8000 from Reef Octopus with a bubble blaster pump because we feel that has a lot of air draw and it does a really efficient job. With a bare bottom tank, we find that having an adequate protein skimmer is a very valuable piece of equipment. Rather than having it in the sump, we have it in a more conveniently located place on the other side of the wall where we can get to the cup and clean as need be. So what about things like filter socks on a system this large? We actually don't use filter sock. We use a very large filter pad because of its ease of use and its economical cost. This tank is a bare bottom tank, so what is it relying on for biological filtration? The rock in this system, pretty much, it's 10 years old and it's been in water since well before this tank. Established rock is a simple, stable core of biological filtration. So we've got the skimmer, we've got the filter floss, we've got the mature rock. Are you guys using anything like carbon or GFO? We don't use GFO, but we do periodically use carbon, and it's only on a very intermittent basis, generally a week at a time. We use carbon for water clarity, which is particularly important because of its four foot depth. There's a lot of water moving through this place between your retail customers and what you guys need here. What are you guys using to filter your tap water? We use a commercial RO unit, which produces roughly around 1,100 gallons per day. Uh, so you're telling me no DI resin? Actually, no. The unit that we use actually produces zero TDS, so we didn't feel the need to go any further. All right, Josh, we're moving on to the third component of reef tank biology, lighting. What are you guys using? Above this tank, we have 12 Gen 4 Pros, and we also have three rows of 80-watt Blue Plus T5s. The lights are mounted about two feet above the water, and left to right, they're spaced about 12 inches apart. On a home aquarium, that's pretty tall above the tank. Why do you guys mount them at 24 inches above them? By mounting these lights higher above the tank, it allows them to blanket the tank with more even intensities. We could mount the lights lower, but it would take a lot more lights to cover the same amount of space, and then we wouldn't be able to work underneath them as easily as we can now. So Josh, you have all these lights, all the horsepower behind it. Why do you guys feel the need for T5s? We use the T5s for the reduced shadowing effect and the even distribution of light. Which probably also leads to less tissue loss, right? Correct. So what kind of part does that lighting setup produce? Have you guys tested it? It's going to range anywhere from 80 in the corners mm -hmm. to maybe 350 at the top of the colonies. And what do you expect the middle to be like? Somewhere in the vicinity of 150. So I've seen some reefers with SPS dominant tanks shoot for higher than 350 par. Why do you guys top out at 350? We could likely have spots of higher power than 350. However, we're trying to appeal to the whole tank rather than just a few. 
And with as many corals as we have in one spot, it's better to cater to the entire tank. We talked about intensity. Let's shift to spectrum. We're going to share their full EcoSmart Live programming a little bit later. But why don't you tell me a little something about your guys' spectrum? Our schedule consists of a 12-hour photo period, which is predominantly blue. But it's based on EcoSmart Live's AB Plus schedule, and we modified it to fit our needs. It has a five-hour white photo period in the beginning of the day. In relation to filtration, proper flow and circulation is the lifeblood to the entire filtration process. What do you guys use for flow on this 900-gallon tank? On this tank, we use two Hydro Wizard ECM 63s, which have a gradual rise and fall in intensity. On the back side of the tank, we use two Max Spec Gyre 280s to create that flow on the back side that we wouldn't otherwise have. On the bottom corners, we sweep the floor with two ECM 42s, which are the smaller power head from Hydro Wizards. So, is there a reason why you guys went with Max Spec Gyres for the back of the tank? We use the gyre up top in the back because the colonies are actually really close to the surface of the water and the flow pattern that comes from them is really flat and it allows for us to keep it close to the surface of the water. Those look like some pretty massive pumps on the side. How much flow are they putting out? They are massive. They do 13,500 gallons per hour. So most of the flow in this tank comes from the power heads inside. What do you guys do to rotate the water through the filtration system in the sump? We use DART hybrid pumps, which are approximately 3,600 gallons per hour. Now, how many of those do you guys have? Just the one. The last component of reef tank biology is nutrients, which we'll talk about nitrates and phosphates, as well as what you're feeding the tank. So starting with the nitrates and phosphates, what do you guys normally test this tank at? This tank generally stays within 0 to 0.1 in phosphate levels, which we don't want to stay at 0, but we do strive to stay underneath 1. Why do you guys stray away from zero phosphates? We stray away from zero because zero is kind of tricky on some of the, the more delicate LPS. You know, diaceris and chalice, they don't like that really low level of phosphorus. So you guys target a phosphate range under 0.1. Why is that? Our acropora color better, they grow faster, and the algae doesn't grow nearly as fast. So you say this tank runs around 20 parts per million nitrate, which is higher than what I've seen many reefers shoot for. Why is that? I don't think anybody's identified the perfect level of nitrate, and this one stays about 25, so in the spirit of keeping things simple, we leave it. So in relation to other types of nutrients, are you guys supplementing the tank with amino acids or anything like that? We don't supplement the tank with amino acids directly. Uh, we do, however, use particulate foods and amino acids in our fish blend. So you guys make your own food for these tanks? We do make our own food. It consists of fish and shrimp, um, reef roids, bright wall coral amino, spirulina, a whole bunch of other stuff. So with a tank this large, how often do you feed? We feed all of our tanks the same. We feed on the hour, every hour. That's a lot of feeding. Do you recommend that the average reefer feed that much? Probably not a good idea. This is a pretty controlled environment. The reason we do feed this much in this tank is because there's so much biomass uptaking all of what we put into it. If we didn't feed as much as we do, we would never meet the nutritional demand of this many corals in one system. That's also the reason why we don't run into algae issues or overfeeding problems that comes along with feeding as much as we do because there's so much biomass in this tank. Moving on to maintenance, maintenance for a system this big has got to be pretty robust. What do you guys do for maintenance in terms of water changes? For water changes, we do a 15% water change, which we usually do in conjunction with siphoning out the dirt piles that <laughs> add up in the tank. How often are you doing these water changes? Once a week, religiously. So you mentioned keeping the bottom of the tank clean. What does that look like? We have two of the small hydro wizards, and they push all the dirt out into the front of the tank, and it usually collects in a couple of small piles, and that's where we remove it from. So what's your method of cleaning the glass? We magnet it once a day with an extra large mag float. Mm -hmm. We'll actually spray the outside down with some RO water, magnet the tank, and then squeegee it clean. That way it's dual purpose, inside and out, one shot. So your, your primary filtration were the filter pads and the skimmers. How often are you cleaning those? We have it on our closing duties at night to do twice a week filter pads and twice a week skimmer cups. Cleaning these large power heads is probably a pretty big task. How often are you doing that? We do it when they show signs of algae. We pull them apart, we throw them in vinegar, let them soak for a little bit, scrub them off, make sure everything's working on the inside of them, and we put them back. 
it is a display tank, so we try to keep them nice and clean. That way they always look good. But it helps us make sure that they're always in working order as well. So you guys are using the Dart Hybrid, which I know requires some periodic maintenance. How do you guys handle that? Most of the time, if it needs any kind of maintenance, it's a seal, which they do go. So we pull them out, we clean everything off, we'll replace the seal, make sure there's nothing inside of the impeller, and put it back together. Let's talk about medications. Do you dose anything to this tank? From time to time, we have a weird algae, or I call it an algae, that grows on these zoanthids on the bottom of the tank. And we will use ChemiClean, but other than that, no. All right, Josh, we're going to wrap things up, and I've got a couple extra questions for you. What would you do differently to this tank? Aside from fish selection, because we do have a resident coral muncher in there, um, I think it's under constant refinement. So we're always trying to modify coral placement and different flow patterns. So in that respect, we're always going to make changes to the tank, and it allows us to not do things the same every time. Mm. So really, a lot of us are trying to achieve the same level that you guys have done here at WWC. Do you have any tips on coral health and color in general? Sure. I think one of the keys to our success is making sure that we have adequate flow. And I don't just mean flow, because everybody always says, I have enough flow. But if you have no sand and you can deliver the flow properly, especially with Acropora, you're not going to see colors better. All right, Josh, a final question for you. A lot of us learn through our growth in this hobby. What have you learned from this 900-gallon reef? Well, we used to have metal halides on this tank, and I feel like that was a really simplistic approach to lighting. You could basically plug it into the wall and have instant success. There was no thinking involved. There was a learning curve in the transition from metal halides to LEDs including height above the water, intensity, and spectrum, and so on. So in that respect, it wasn't as plug and play. We wanted to pave the way for those who weren't 100% sure the LEDs were the way to go. With the pros heavily outweighing the con, that's why we decided to make the move. So in relation to that, we're going to thank Josh for his time and let him go. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Randy. And in true BRS fashion, we're going to provide you with the in-depth specs and mounting heights and lighting spectrums and everything that runs this tank and provide them to you so that you can try to replicate this same success at home. Okay, we're back to wrap up this episode where we're going to share the data we collected for the 900-gallon tank. And as I mentioned, in true BRS TV fashion, we took a ton of measurements from the light spacing and mounting heights down to two sets of PAR measurements based on WWC's unique lighting schedule inside EcoSmart Life. Let's break it down for you, starting first with the tank dimensions again, which were 12 feet long by 4 feet front to back and 31 inches tall, with 12 Radeon XR30s and 6 retrofitted 60-inch ATI Blue Plus bulbs. Lengthwise, there are two rows of six radions that are spaced about 14 inches apart from center of one puck to the center of the other, which ends up dividing the tank pretty evenly across the four-foot depth. From left to right, the fixtures are on average 10 and a half inches apart from the inside edge to inside edge, meaning that each fixture ends up covering about a two-foot area. The T5 bulbs and reflectors are divided into three rows of two 80-watt bulbs that are pretty much butted up to each other across the tank with nearly 20 inches between the center of each row, which are designed to provide fill light within the tank for shadow reduction, which can be difficult to achieve when using LEDs alone. In that same mindset of even distribution and spread, all of these lights are hung much higher than the average reefer would in their own home. As Josh mentioned earlier, he ballparked the mounting height to be around 24 inches above the tank. However, after I put the ruler to them, I found out that they are actually right at 20 and a half inches off the water surface. So what kind of par can we expect from this much light over a 12-foot tank this size? Let's take a look at the modified Ecotech AB Plus schedule that WWC runs on their display tanks, which has two distinct spectrums throughout the day, an hour ramp up time and 15-minute ramp down, all creating a total photo period of a 12 and a half hours. The T5s come on at 8 a.m. and stay on until 4 p.m. And for the first part of the day, from about 7.30 to noon, you can see that all the blue and violet channels are at 100%, with cool whites and greens at 50 and reds at 10%. For the rest of the day, from about noon till 7 p.m., the cool whites, greens, and reds are all turned off with everything else the same, which leaves the tank pretty blue, but the coral's looking awesome. With this in mind, we took a handful of PAR measurements at various depths throughout the tank near some of our favorite corals during the morning and afternoon spectrum settings using a combo of the Apogee MQ510 and MQ210 PAR meters. 
We use them both as the MQ510 has a better sensor for reading the blue spectrum, whereas the MQ210 is a more affordable option. As you'll see when we get into the PAR readings next, although the 510 may have the better sensor, I think for the average reefer, the difference between the two readings isn't really going to be enough to make any dramatic changes, and in the end, we're really only looking for a ballpark number. For your reference and to help you make your own decisions, we've posted the readings for both sensors, with the left being the MQ210 and the right being the 510. It's immediately apparent that one isn't remarkably different than the other. While in theory the MQ510 should read blue better, there are a variety of reasons that we outline in depth in one of our BRS TV Investigates episode on popular PAR meters put to the test as to why in many cases they'll produce similar numbers. For the first five hours, the tank lighting is the brightest in the center where there's the most intersecting light from all the light sources. And you can see that a vast majority of the PAR numbers are within the 200 to 350 range with a total PAR average of 248. This even distribution of PAR is worth noting here and speaks volumes to how the diffuse light is implemented so that it covers the entire tank from the four foot front to back as well as the 31 inches top to bottom, which is likely why they can maintain SPS corals in nearly every portion of this tank. Looking at the sides of the tank, we're seeing predominantly 150 to 300, which obviously has a lower average than the center because of less light intersection, but this also allows the opportunity to diversify the coral types by adding in some LPS and softies. Again, we can easily see that you don't need super high par to have success, with tons of SPS thriving in the 200s and even some in the upper 100s. Being a stickhead myself and after seeing these results, I will personally start aiming for a range in my tanks around 250 with a diffused light source, knowing that I'll achieve the same averages across the entire tank and find similar success. Moving on to the last seven or so hours of the day when the tank is running on the bluer spectrum, the overall PAR average only drops about 50 to an overall average of 201, with most readings falling somewhere between the high 100s and low to medium 200s, and the sides of the tank ranging mostly from the low 100s to low 200s. Here again we can see that the PAR is much lower than what is widely assumed to be needed for SPS, and this is a shining example of what can be achieved if emulated. In fact, for those reefers who do aspire for those wall-to-wall -wall SPS dominant tanks, whether in something as large as the WWC 900 gallon tank or for a bit more realistic average reefer in their home tanks, there's definitely a few takeaways for using LEDs to achieve this. One, mount your lights high in order to provide more even light distribution to reduce or eliminate hot spots and shadowing. Two, if mounting the lights significantly higher isn't an option, then you'll likely need to get a lot more light fixtures than you originally thought to achieve the same light distribution from a tiny puck. And three, if buying an enormous amount of LEDs is outside of your budget, a solid option for providing that fill-in light is to add in some T5 bulbs, which is obviously what the pros with a very considerable amount of resources choose to do here at WWC. Before we close this one out, if there's one thing to leave with after seeing WWC's success is that it's actually a very direct recipe for everything that goes into producing this awesome 900 gallon reef tank from lighting, filtration, chemistry, maintenance, and nutrient input. That means if you follow this recipe exactly, you should be able to achieve the same results on your own. Stay tuned next week for the same in-depth tour of another amazing tank at the WWC store with the 500 gallon system in the front lobby where I'll ask Josh about their recipe for that tank, expand on it further, and show you exactly why it's not only replicable if followed, but will also produce the same results time and time again. And the week after that, I'll dive into WWC's reefing recipe for the 293 mixed reef in the front lobby and discover the differences and similarities between all three tanks. I can tell you with certainty that for my next mixed reef, this is one recipe I'll quickly pull out and use myself. As with each week, we're giving away some awesome prizes, and this week we've got three $250 gift cards up for grabs for your opinion on what style powerhead you like the most. So click on that link in the lower left or head over to the site and click on the free prizes link at the very top of the page to get signed up. As always, thanks for watching and subscribing, and if you haven't already, be sure to hit that notification icon bell to get alerted when we put out the next video. See you next time on BRS TV.